right, well, good morning. Glad to see everybody here today, and I know many folks are uh, live streaming as well with us, and we apologize for the delay in that, but I think we've got all the buds fixed in our live stream, so we should be good to go for the rest of this morning. Uh, we do want to make mention of the fact that uh, our church family received it in the email, but maybe for our live stream audience, they're still uh, tuning in where they can, so from this point forward... The door's blowing outwards. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's coming into the building. All right. And so from this point forward, uh, we're going to be having some condensed services like we did back in the early months of 2020. And that is not to be reacted to anybody that has had COVID in our church. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, that's not the case at this time. But we are being proactive uh, because we do understand the numbers are starting to go back up. Cold weather's coming in and uh, flu season and other illnesses are starting to creep back, back up. So we just want to be proactive to the best of our ability, and uh, we're going to try to limit <coughs> our meetings as well. A lot of that will be discussed tonight in the business meeting, so if you have the opportunity to come back tonight, uh, please do so. We are we would be greatly encouraged by your presence. But it's so good to see Greg back, and I know he had some hiccups in the harvest and the uh, the corn. Corn can be, a, it can be an obstacle, can it? And so, Dred, would you please pray for the morning service today, sir? Amen. And we are continuing to pray for Kim as she's going through the treatments along with uh, Patty, who's still recovering from her accident as well. I'm going to make sure this is working great. And so uh, if you have your bulletin, please open those up real quick, and we'll go over some announcements. And uh, we do have one special prayer request that I promised Jason we would pray over um, this morning. And, and so we're going to mention that here as well. So, of course, November 22nd, which is just around the corner next week, we are having our Thanksgiving service, and so that's just going to be a time of uh, coming in here, and we'll be having a special service for Thanksgiving, catered around the uh, fest festival day of Thanksgiving, but more so I would like to encourage to have a spirit of Thanksgiving. I noticed, and I made mention, made mention of this, and I was kind of being sarcastic. If you don't, haven't kind of realized on Facebook, I like to be sarcastic about things. I find things humorous in that regard. Um, but it is kind of a sad truth that so many Christians, at least from my environment that I've seen in my little circle, uh, I don't see the typical every year in the last four, three or four years that's been quite popular. You know, day one, I'm thankful for this. Day two, I'm thankful for this. Day three, I'm thankful for this. And so it seems like, you know, between the election and COVID and a lot of other obstacles in 2020, we've kind of been distracted from being thankful for what we're given and what we have this year. And so next Sunday is going to highlight that, and I encourage you to tune in if you're with our live stream and come back. And uh, we want to come back with the spirit of Thanksgiving, especially as you all go back to your respective families on Thanksgiving Day and celebrate that wonderful time as well. With that being said, though, we are for sure... 100% positive, not going to have a Wednesday night service on the 25th. And then, like I made mention, we'll have a couple other uh, alterations as we move forward from this point forward um, as well, looking at our calendar. And so that'll be made mention tonight and be let known to the church family and to our Facebook friends uh, when that all gets official. So also, I wanted to make mention of the fact Jason Gordon, of course, we know Jason, he is not with us this morning because... Uh, He's watching online and trying to stand on standby for his uncle, uh, Mark. And many of you probably heard the prayer, prayer request last night, uh, but he's having a lung transplant today, and that's about an 8 to 12-hour surgery. And so uh, we want to pray for him. Of course, any, any number of things. There's a lot of obstacles there with lung transplants, making sure the body accepts it, make sure there's no infection. Uh, when it leaves the uh, one case into the person's body and so forth. And so transplants can be a difficult thing. So I'm going to go ahead and take the time for just a few moments to pray for uh, Jason's uncle Mark at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we, as Brother Red mentioned, we do thankful for being in the house of the Lord, and we pray for the morning service. But Father, Lord, I 
want to come before you together. The Lord, he said, where two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be also. And we want to corporately pray over the Jordan family at this time. Lord, we understand this gentleman by the name of Mark, who's in a relationship with Jason as an uncle, uh, is having an 8 to 12 hour surgery today, starting at 5 o'clock this morning, um, getting a complete lung transplant, Lord. Lord, we understand that that's a very serious surgery. A lot of life alterations are happening at this time. And Father, Lord, we just trust that the you will be upon this surgery in a special way and give comfort to the family as they're kind of on standby right now just waiting to get any news and receive any news during this time. And so, Lord, we pray that uh, everything will be successful. We pray that this will be a good outcome and pray that the body accepts this 100%, Father, and, Lord, that he'll have a quick recovery from this transplant, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of the Jordans and their love for you, and we just ask that you... Uh, share your blessings unto them today. In Jesus' name, amen. And so that's all we have for a prayer request at the moment and our announcement. If you do have any prayer requests that you want to make mention, uh, please let me know and we will add them. Of course, we always do add them onto our prayer list and get that out to folks. And so uh, let's go ahead and turn to your Bible and we will have our time of the... Oh, no, I take that back. I about made this mistake. I, I, she gave me the look. All right, we have a special... And it is a great and wonderful special. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you, Alex, for that wonderful special, and uh, I pray that you do understand and maybe contemplate the faithfulness of God. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He's faithful to bring us back when we have a repentant heart, and he's faithful to lead us even in times of uncertainty. And uh, speaking of that, you know, I did, I did forget to mention, but uh, we, I did speak to Jesse Woods, and so she's, the, uh, she's on a board over the Wabash Valley that deals specifically with COVID in the area. And I was talking to her a little bit last night 
about some of the implications and the uh, alterations that we're making as a church. And she did confirm, and I was trying to ask some questions, you know, as far as regards as, uh, you know, in the season of winter, we noticed that COVID is starting to go up and all these things. I said, you know, is, is this coincidental? Is this something that's just happening because of we're getting lapsed? And she said, not really. Uh, cold weather produces, you know, the flu and the cold virus and so forth. And so corona is just like any other virus. And so we should see numbers increasing. So we're just doing our best to limit the exposure here in church. You know, the last thing I want to do from a shepherd's heart is cause an environment that somebody would get COVID in the church. And I know it's a 99% survival rate, 99.7, I believe, something like that. But uh, usually when somebody gets COVID, they feel pretty miserable but for about two, three straight weeks. And so, of course, we wouldn't even want to wish that on people. So we just want to be safe and loving to one another and looking out for everybody's safety, both physical, mental, and spiritual as well. So that's all I want to say about that. We will probably talk more about it tonight. Uh, if you have questions on your mind, bring them forward with us this evening, and we can talk about that as well. But today, I want to talk about the real church. So 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bible, turn to the book, 1 Corinthians. And we're still continuing the series in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I pray, pray that 1 Corinthians has been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me as I've been studying it and looking over it and applying it in my life as a pastor, as a Christian, and seeing what its implications can be for any church and our church as well. But the question that we've been asked I know we kind of, we're in this time of the year where we're going to be doing a little more holidays and seasonal messages and going back into our series, the First Corinthians, so just kind of a refresher, is that we're looking at a church and seeing that Corinthian church has got a lot of problems. They have a lot of problems that they brought out of the culture in their area into their church. And Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is dealing with these problems and he's trying to bring them back to what we would call the ideal church, the real church, the church that Christ died for, the church that these Christians, Corinthian Christians, should strive to be. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to 3, if you recall, dealt with pretty much unity because there was disunity in the church of Corinth. And he was really trying to bring them back together and they needed to be together because they needed to understand not to bring the culture of man into their church, but to let God deal with them specifically. Because as we bounce off from chapter 4 going into the rest of the book, we're going to deal with some practical applications and some things that would deal very close to our hearts, uh, quite possibly. And so the first one that we're going to be talking about today is living with expectations. Living with expectations. You see, we live in a world that is full of expectations. How many of you have a... uh, boss at your job. Yeah, yeah. And how many of you say, and for some, I, got, I know we got a lot of farmers out here, and you guys bring your crops to, uh, to I think, what, what do they call that? It's not really a storage unit, a processing unit of sorts. And you have to abide by what prices they give you, right? You just can't go up and say, well, I want $5 a bushel or whatever, or whatever the cost is of that thing. You just don't get that luxury. You know, in any job I think that we have, we have a boss. We have somebody that we answer to. And quite possibly with our bosses, they give us expectations. Our parents have expectations of us. Chase and Aubrey, does your parents have expectations of you? Do you have a, do you have a time where you need to go to bed? Do you, have, do you have to brush your teeth every day? Yeah. I tell you, when you get older and become adults, your parents still have expectations of you. Our employment, and for those of us that are married, even our spouses have expectations of you. Likewise, we expect many things in our lives as well. You say, how so, Pastor? Well, let me, let me give you a few for instance. I was just thinking about this over the weekend, of things that we expect, and probably you take granted for, but could very easily go wrong in any one of our lives. When you go through a drive through do you expect warm, fresh, whole food? I mean, you never go through a drive-thru and expect, oh boy, I can't wait to have a half-eaten burger. I mean, I just love it when one of those guys just take a good bite out of the burger and then put it back in the box and I get to finish the rest of my meal. I mean, that, that just warms my heart. I love that. I love doing that. 
No. I have a, and I know there's a couple of restaurants that do this specifically, and I don't know why, but when you go into a restaurant, do you expect to order your food and then say, okay, hang on, I'm going to go to the kitchen and I'll just cook it myself. Don't worry about bringing it out to me. I, I want to cook my own food. No, we expect the restaurant to bring our food. Or when you go, do you just go to work to just volunteer yourself or do you expect to get paid? And you say, well, some days I think it is volunteer. I, I know, I know. See, this is where we find Paul today in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, we left off from chapter 1 and 3 where Paul persuaded them to stop following Corinthian leaders. They were bringing the leaders of the church and they were bringing in these leaders into their church and bringing in this culture and this culture produced expectations in their life and the advice of the world for quality of life. They were seeking the world to give them the expectations to have a good life. But now, that left them the question when Paul said, don't do this, don't listen to them, don't listen to the world, don't listen to what is going on outside of what the Bible and the church is telling you to do, because what it's going to do is confuse you. And so they left with the question in the church of Corinth, what then should we expect from our leaders? What then should we expect in leadership as Christians? Which we, which we even live today. What does real leadership look like from your church and your family and your careers and much more? For we see how the world tells us what leadership looks like. But now let us see what the Bible corrects in that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll read verses four or uh, chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to have in-person services safely, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we live in a state specifically, a country that honors the religious liberties of the church at this time, and Lord, that we have the luxury and the liberty to practice what we believe in, and we believe the Word of God. Lord, we pray now that you allow us to have open hearts, open minds, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life Father, Lord, I know that every one of us here has expectations of some sort, that we live with expectations in our life of some degree. And Lord, I pray that you help us not to carry those expectations into our life. Some may be good and some may be bad. But Father, allow the word of truth to pierce our heart and to convict us if there needs to be convicted, comfort if there needs to be comfort, encouragement if there needs to be encouragement. Lord, we pray these things and seek your blessings today. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So read with me verses 1 through 6 here, and then we'll be getting started today. And so chapter 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, but with me it is a very small thing. This is Paul still talking to the church now, to me being Paul. It is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure, transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written." that no one of you be puffed up, one for against the other. So we see in living a life with expectation, Paul corrects it and says, really, the first aspect of this is that we should be living in faithfulness. The first aspect of of a biblical leadership, of biblical leadership, of real Christian leadership, of whether you're a leadership in your home, whether you have a leadership in your career, whether you're above somebody in your life of some sort, you need to be living in faithfulness. Look at that in verse 1 to 3 again. The Bible says from verse 1 to 3, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards, what is those next few words? It is required in stewards of the, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Living in faithfulness. So he first tells the church how to address leaderships. He's talking about the apostles, namely in verse 1, but we can apply it in our life as leaders wherever you find yourself at all today, for we all have some form of leadership in our life, uh, whether it be in your community, whether it be in your family, whether it be in your career, whether it be in your church, wherever you find it, we have leadership somewhere in our life. 
And the Bible tells us that real leaders don't look at them as CEOs. They don't look at them as administrators. They don't look at themselves as puffed up beings. But as what Paul says as apostles, looked at us, let men so account of us, the apostles, as of what ministers or servants of Christ and stewards or governor or manager of the mysteries of God. He didn't use any, he didn't use any word talking about ownership. He didn't use any word talking about CEO mentality. He didn't use any word talking about uh, to puff himself up in status. Both of these words, minister and stewards, talked about being below somebody, one being the servant, the other one being a manager, being below somebody and taking care of things that are not ours. So when Paul instructed them to look up to the apostles as ministers and stewards. He said he is but a servant to Jesus, not establishing himself in his own works or successes, but simply faithfully following wherever Jesus tells him to go. Paul went throughout all the Roman world and planted churches wherever he went, literally led thousands to the Lord, was raised from the dead, healed, cast out demons, cast out diseases. He did so much... And all he said is, count me as a servant of God. He was one of the greatest Christians, if not the greatest Christians that ever lived, and he said, consider me as a servant of the Lord. This goes in strike contrast of what leadership looks like in the world. I found a picture online, and uh, it's got biblical principles in it, but doesn't exert from any chapter, but it makes pretty good sense. You've probably seen it before, too, sometime talking about what a boss mentality looks like and what a leadership mentality looks like. And Paul pretty much was saying as a leader that he was a servant, he was a steward, he was one that was with the force, one that was with the church, one that was with many other Christians performing the gospel work. He wasn't trying to tell them that he was up here telling them what to do. He was in the battlefield, he was in the trenches, he was living life with them and leading them forward. And so Paul gave a strike contrast to what world leadership looks like. You know, worldly views of leadership tells us that we must be number one, we must demand respect, we must demand the attention, we must demand our authority, and then execute it. But the Bible tells us that real leaders are not authoritarians, but servants. There was a really famous saying, and I don't know quite who said it. There's a lot of people that have said it. And I've said it once before in my life and kind of lived by it. That is, if you have to go around telling everybody that you're the boss, then you're probably not the boss. And you know some people like that. You say, Pastor, I worked underneath somebody like that. They just throw their authority wherever they go. Well, you got to listen to me because of my status. you got to listen to what I do because I am this position. Real leadership isn't bossing, it's leading. Matthew 23, verse 11 says this, But he that is greatest among you shall be your what? Servant. Christ says if you want to be the greatest, want to be one of the greats in the kingdom, you're not going to be a CEO, you're going to be a servant. To go up in heaven, to go up in position, if we even want to look at that, is to serve more. In the view of the Christians, leadership is opportunity to serve more, not to command more, to be a better steward, a manager over the God's resources and not our own. For in reality, we own nothing. You say, well, pastor, that's not true. Okay, well, tell me. You know, you say, okay, well, I worked hard for my paycheck at the end of the week. That is my money. Well, did you tell yourself, hey, body, we got to get up tomorrow. Hey, you got you to continue. I continually made my heart continue to beat. I continually breathed the air and pushed out the air so that I can work every second. Or was that God given blessing? He said, Well, I worked for my food. Well, did you go out and actually try to make the food grow miraculously and do all the things you needed to do? Did you pour the water on it? Did you find the resource of the water? Did you produce the water? Or did you use God's resources? to produce the blessings in your life. You see, if you stop and think about it, nothing that we have is our own. Everything is of God's. We're just stewards of what God has given us. Our life, 
our breath, our resources, what we wear, what we live, what we, we eat, everything is given to us and how we are managing it. And the Bible tells us in verse 2 that we are required to be faithful. Let that man be found faithful in his stewardship. I want to ask you a question. Are you faithful in the stewardship that God has given you? Are you, you say, well, oh, pastor, all I'm doing right now is just trying to live life from day, day to day. I'm just, I'm told what to do. I'm, I'm instructed to get these things done. I really don't have much independence outside of that. Well, are you faithful with what God has brought into your life? Are you faithful to the family that you are given? Are you faithful to the resources that you are entrusted to care over? The things that God has trusted you, are you being faithful over? If God has entrusted you a family, are you faithfully leading them, investing into them to the best of your abilities, pointing them back to the word of truth? If God has entrusted you with a career, are you being faithful to being a good steward over it, using the time and the culture God has brought to you for his glory or just to make it a payday? Last week, I had the uh, opportunity. I enjoy, I enjoy these opportunities. I had the opportunity, and Erin's not here, and she's supposed to be here because I wanted to point her out, but she, was, she, she, came, she talked to me last week, and she texted me, and she said, Hey, Pastor, I have a situation. And this was at work where she was teaching. And she said, I have a situation where I can plant the gospel in somebody's life, and I would like some of the best resources that you know. Erin was using her career to produce gospel and eternal effects, finding opportunity to be a servant of God. Now, would it just be as easy for us to say, you know what, I'm going to work Monday through Friday. I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention to anybody around me. I'm just going to work until I get that payday. I don't care about any problems. I don't care about anybody. I have my own problems. Just let me work until my payday. Put it in the bank, and I'll worry about it next week. No matter where you're at in your life, God brings people into your life, and you are a steward over that. Steward over the opportunities that you are given. In verse 3, he, clo he closes out this first point about being faithful, working for the man. Paul says that since he is but a servant to Jesus, he must be faithful only to Jesus. And that he then doesn't care... You, you say this is going to be harsh, but it's true. This is what he's saying. That he then doesn't care how others judge or think of him. You say, that's not true. Read with me. But it is a very small thing. It means little to nothing to me that I, Paul, should be judged of you, church of Corinth. Or, for that matter, any man's judgment. Anybody. Yeah, I don't even have an opinion of my own self. Why? Because back in verse 1, he says, I am just a servant of Christ. You see, one commentator, one pastor said it this way. He said, a servant is only concerned what the master thinks. A servant doesn't really care what other servants think. If you're only, if, if it's true that you're only faithful and you should only, your only stewardship is by God, because God's given us everything, nobody else, and that you are faithful to him and only faithful to him and you only answer to him, then the answer would be, and bring us to the point, that we don't have to answer, or not really when he's the word answer, we don't have to consider anybody else's opinions or judgment, I should say. And this is a really free thing when you get to this point. You see, as Christians, we seem to revolve around what other Christians think of us. Churches today are attacked by what their music is, what their style of clothing is, what Bible translation they use, what school their pastor graduated from. You don't have to worry about that with me. Nobody's going to attack you for that. What kind of community involvement they do. You know, I was, I was talking to pastors and from long past since, uh, with, even in, our, in my school, we was, I was listening to some of the conversations they had. And as we were approaching the time of Halloween, there was time of saying, well, you know what? I left for my church to do the trick-or-treating or the trunk-or-treating, but I don't want anybody to be wearing uh, those witches or goblins or mummies or vampires or anything like that because that will hinder the gospel. To be gospel effective is really me wearing a vampire costume, passing out a tract 
to other people wearing other costumes in that environment. Is that irrelevant to what me being a servant of Christ is? If our conviction of Christ is yielding us to have that liberty, Paul says we should not care about the judgment of others. You see, when we get to this point, it will free you. It is free, and it is a fresh breath of air. It is a load off our shoulders. It is the weight of expectation being gone that we are not called to live up to others, but only to God and his word. See, that's what Paul was saying in Galatians. Because Galatians took it as saying, oh, Paul, you're telling us from these verses, because he said the same thing to them, that we have liberty to do whatever we want. And God said, Dr. Bid. Your standard is not held to what other people think of you. Your standard of your life should be the word of truth. Okay? If your life is aligned to the Bible and the Holy Spirit does not convict in you, now we can ignore the conviction. Oh, I'm not being convicted. But if you're being honest with yourself, being honest with the Spirit, and, not, and the Holy Spirit is not convicting you, then Paul says... I'm not worried about your judgment. Because he was being harshly judged. Remember in verses, or chapter 2 and verse 1 to, one to 5, right there on the other page if, if you have your Bible open. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with beautiful words or man's wisdom, but just simply the Holy Spirit and the power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men in my ability, but in the power of God. Remember, we talked about the church of Corinth was looking down on Paul because of the way he presented himself and the speech that he used. But he said, to me, it's a very small thing what you think of me, what you judge of me for that. Because I am found faithful to Christ. It doesn't matter what we think or judge of each other. What only matters is how faithful we are to what Christ asks of us. Which leads us to our second point, which is even far more greater. So we have the liberty to live for Christ. We are faithful to Christ. We are bounded by what the Word tells us, not by what man tells us. And so why is this such important? Because there's going to come a day... Everybody, no matter who you are, there is coming the day when we're going to meet the one. You asked who is the one. You probably already know. Read with me verse 4 to 5 there. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. You see, Paul continues on to validate this claim that we can live and have liberty in the Bible and not in what man's opinions of us because he declares the truth that there will be no one in the coming time of Jesus, there will be no one that we have to stand before to give an answer to except Jesus. I don't have to go up to heaven one day and present my ministry and my lifestyle before anybody else, before any other pastor, before any other board, before anybody except Christ. That's what's going to happen for the Christian. There's two types of judgments that will happen to us. You see, the time of Christ is the days of judgment. And the first one is a judgment of salvation. There will come a day when the only question matters in your whole life, your existence depends on it, if you've ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's going to come that day. Biblically, or in theology speaking, doctrinally speaking, the Revelation calls it the great white throne judgment. But all we have to know about it is that there's going to come a day of judgment of salvation. Is your name written on the book of life? And it doesn't matter what church membership you belong to. It doesn't matter what good works you did. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your lifestyle is. It doesn't matter how much you loved anybody. The only thing that mattered is if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, died for your sins, and believe that he rose again on the third day and you asked him to come into your life that's it nothing else matters on that day 
Not what you did. Not how much good you did. Not how much bad you did. But did you believe in the gospel? Not how much you gave. Not for all the things you think you've done right. But did you believe in the gospel? Did you ask Jesus Christ to become your personal Lord and Savior? And as Christians, we have done that. In which we find ourselves in that second form of judgment, if we want to call it that, is a judgment of faithfulness. A judgment of faithfulness. Remember verse 2 there in chapter 4, Paul said it was required of the stewards that we be found faithful. Why? Because in verse 5, there is going to come a time where we judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, the inner motives of our heart, and will make manifest the counsels of our heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. If you haven't underlined that in your Bible, I want you to underline those last six, seven words there. Every man shall have praise of God. The judgment, what we call the beam of seat of Christ for Christians, is not one where God's going to judge your life and say, okay, these are all the bad things you did as a Christian. These are all the good things you did as a Christian. Let, let me see what weighs up and see if I give you a couple of rewards or if I give you a lot of rewards. A lot of people miss, have a misconception about what this judgment looks like. And Paul gives an answer to it right here. The entire time when we stand before the Lord as Christians one day is the time of how faithful we are to him. And what will happen, what this is going to happen right here, is that we're not going to be judged. He's not going to criticize. He's not going to look down on us. He's going to praise us. Every man shall have praise of the heavenly Father God. He's going to say, hey, you did a good job being faithful for me right there. Hey, you did a good thing coming to church and, and giving that to me when, when the preacher preached that. Hey, you did a good thing when you gave somebody the gospel there. Good job on that. He's going to give us praise. You say, well, what about our sins? What, what about the bad things we've done? That was all taken care of on the cross. All of our sins will be gone from as far as the east is to the west. He will choose not to remember those. And he is God and he can do that. As a Christian, you're not going to be judged by what you've done, what you didn't do, what sins you have in your life, how unfaithful you were to him in times. During this time, it's going to be how faithful you were to him. How faithful you were to Christ after he saved you. What did you do as a steward? What did you do as a steward, a manager, a servant of your life that was bought by Christ. The moment we accepted salvation, we asked Christ to become our Savior, and He took our sins, put it on the cross, and brought our life from a destiny going to hell to a destiny going to heaven. He bought our life. He declared us justified and freely forgiven. And what did we do with that purchase? Did we go back to living the world the way we did before we got saved? Or did we make our life mean something? Did we love others as God loved us? Did we share the gospel to our friends and family in a loving way? Every man shall have praise of God. God will not judge you for your sins, but for, for your judgment was already nailed to the cross. So, the question then is asked, who wants to hear praise from God? Say, Pastor, I would love to stand before the Lord, and I would love to hear how well done thy good and faithful servant. You know, but I think for a lot of Christians today, there's going to be a pretty vacancy in the few times in their life where they were found faithful for God. It's going to be a small praised time for them. So, if, lastly here, and we'll wrap it up, if we live for the one and this is going to come out kind of harshly, but it's true. And then we live for no one. What do you mean, Pastor? How do we live for one, but then we live for no one? If we live for the one that is outside of this world and in heaven, and is our Lord and Savior, our Heavenly Father, then on this side of the world, in, this, in, the, in the world that we live in, 
we really live for no one on this side of the world. Now, we live to serve others, but our life is bound by no one. And you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, give me a minute. In verse 6, we read, and lastly here, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. He's saying, I took on the servanty. I took on the stewardship. I came not as an apostle, but as a servant. I came not in authority, but in service for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men, the apostles, the Christian leaders of that day, above that which is written. That no one of you be puffed up for one another against another. If you haven't underlined that in your Bible, I hope you have. That you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. And there's one thing we've done, uh, the Corinthian Christians were really good at, was taking men and their circle and their culture and their environment and putting them above the word of truth. They wanted to hear what men had to say more so than what God had to say. They wanted to hear what men had to say, what men's principles were, what other so-called experts thought that they thought was right more so than what they thought the Bible was going to say. And Paul said that him and Apollos did pretty much play the fool for their sakes so that they would not do that for them. You see, as American Christians, we're really good at this. I remember there was a time in my life not so long ago, I think it was about six, seven years ago, I was still in Bible college, and I was just getting out of young puberty, adult puberty, if you will, um, and I was starting to learn that I could grow facial hair. In fact, when Allie met me, I had a one on the top and a bald fade. I looked like little Ermy that came out of the Marine boot camp. I didn't really have, you know, a hairstyle. My dad always just buzzed it all off, and uh, we never had to worry about haircuts because I didn't have anything to go on. And then she said, you look like a cancer patient. And she said, you need to grow some hair. And so I grew some hair, and I started growing some facial hair in the summer. And when I come back in the school, I would see how long I could get away with it. And finally, you know, one of the instructors kind of pulled me to the side. And I'll never forget this. And he said, Cody, if you want to be successful in this world, you're going to have to lose that facial hair. He says, if you want to, if you want to get a good church, if you want to get a success for God, you're going to have to lose that facial hair. I obviously listened to him very well. You see, for many decades, we were taught which Bible translation we were to use. And if we used any other, then we were a backsliding heathen that isn't worthy of heaven. We were taught that we shouldn't go to the movie theaters because that was the place of the devil. We were taught that men had to only wear white dress t-shirts and wide rimmed glasses or they wouldn't grow in God for he doesn't like colors on our backs. What happened? Christian leaders of the day placed their personal standards above that which is written. It's okay to have personal standards. In fact, I encourage you to do that. If a movie theater isn't something that you wish to go to and you think there's a lot of sin in that, that's okay. That's your personal standard. If you want to live a little more conservatively, that's okay. That's your personal standard. But if it's not found in the Bible, we shouldn't make the doctrine out of a personal standard. And this is what the Corinthian culture was doing. They were judging Paul for what he looked like, what he dressed like, what he acted like. But he was still giving them the word of truth. And he's saying, what you're doing is you're putting men above that which is written. I think we're seeing a lot of people exit out of denominational churches and going into non-denominational churches because they or their family have been hurt by leaders who've placed themselves above the word. Even the church of Corinth placed expectations on Paul when he arrived. And we do that to our leaders today. You say, well, pastor, no, we don't. We, we love our leaders. We, we think good of them. The average pastor 
for most people, this was a survey done, and I took a few excerpts out of the survey. And average Christian that, that was asked, what do you expect out of a pastor? What would be a good pastor or spiritual leader for you? He had to be a dynamic communicator. He had to preach like Billy Graham. He had to take the audience all the time. He couldn't, he couldn't be boring. He had to be a powerful visionary. He had to learn where, where they were going, never be without uncertainty, knew every leadership book. He had to be a political commentator. He had to talk about politics. He had to know which politicians to go for. He had to be a social media giant in this day and age. You have to have a podcast. You have to have a YouTube channel. You have to have a Facebook channel. You have to tweet. Pastor's tweeting. That's, I don't get that. Anyways. He has to be a marriage savior. When people come to their problems and say, hey, my marriage is falling apart, save it. And if he doesn't save it or they get divorced, it's the pastor's fault, not theirs. Has to be a social activist, a parental expert. I'm not there yet. Don't, don't depend on me. I'm still trying to figure out how to make a kid go to bed. <laughs> and he had to be a bedside chaplain. You may think that's not a lot to ask for one person, but I would challenge you to try to find somebody in this day and age that can fulfill all nine of those perfectly. You see, we live in a world where we place expectations on everybody. In fact, last ministry I was in, and, and I thought you guys should know this, uh, and, and I did not disagree with it. This is just, so do not leave here and think, oh, pastor didn't like this. I, I, I love this. I, I think everybody needs to learn their strengths and weaknesses. My wife tells me my weaknesses every day, and so I learn what to grow from. But my last ministry I was in, the church did an evaluation on me as an assistant pastor and what my pastoral skills looked like, and I thought I would share with them, uh, share, share you all some of these. I didn't put this in my resume, so not even the deacons knew about this. But they said on some of these here, punctuality and work habits, Cody does a good job of being on time and work habits, meets our expectations. He's a really good example, and, and uh, he loves singing. I don't know where they got that. But uh, they, wish I, they wish I did a little bit more taking notes. Preaching, he meets our expectations. They like the PowerPoints. Bible knowledge, they meet our expectations. Teaching, he does very good, and even Allie does a very good jo job relating to the youth. Allie's mentioned more in this survey more than me, I guess. Availability, it seeds in. It sees expectations. I'm always available. The initiative, maybe plan some monthly activities. Follow directions, meets expectations. This is one of the ones that was my weak points, though. May need improvement on memory. Says I forget quite a bit. And I think I forgot about that because I, I still say I forget a quite a bit. Actually, it's been eight or so years no, seven years, and I still struggle to remember my wife's birthday. So, Computer meets, good question, meets expectations. Computer and technology meets expectations. We all have strengths and weaknesses here. But we live in a world that's full of expectations. It's not just the pastor and what, his, and what he's good at, what he's weak at. Everything in part of our life, we have expectations. If we looked at what a what we expect out of man and the culture and society expects out of man, they expect to be readily handsome, a brilliant philosopher, smart financial wizard, knows how to make money, knows how to bring in money, has a feminine perspective, can understand women's emotions, can relate to women, but not be feminine. It has to be deeply emotional, has to, has to talk about his feelings about sometimes. You know, not just be a stone face about everything. Has to know how to produce good dates. You know, just going out to the state house in town doesn't cut it all the time. We have to learn how to be romantic to our spouses. Has to be a protector and a provider. Has to be a defender of equality because wives are just as equal to husbands. And has to have, and this doesn't mean that he has to have a best friend or a girlfriend, but to, to his relationship, he has to, he has to be a best friend to her. And has to be better than her girlfriend's. Has to be the closest companion. Has to know all about their makeup and everything else. You say, well, that's a lot to ask for a man. Well, look, look at women. And this is where everybody just starts walking out the door right now. This again, this is a list of some societal expectations. Women. 
has to be eternally youthful, has to look just like the day they were when they got married, has to, be, has to have a successful career, breathtakingly beautiful, always on time. I, I like that one, always on time. How many of you struggle with that one? Don't raise your hand. An incredible chef, strong, but not intimidating. You can't, you can't be the head of the family. Always happy, never be in a bad mood because when mama's not happy, nobody's happy. And an attentive mother. We live in a world that has a lot of expectations. We place expectations on people and we don't even know about it. We have expectations placed on us and we don't even know about it. But as Christians, what expectations are you trying to live up to? The world the neighbors, other friends, other Christians, or quite simply, Jesus. See, if you are striving to love only for the Lord, do you consider you're faithful to his leading? Because there's coming a day when we don't have to answer to society and what they expected of us. We don't have to answer to your parents. I mean, you do now. So Chase and Aubrey, you have to, you have to listen to them, okay? There's only going to be one person that you're going to eventually answer for all eternally for what you've done in this life, and it's going to be Jesus. How faithful are you living for him? Let's conclude and go in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, with bowed heads and closed eyes, Lord, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for what you have given us. Lord, you've given us the word of truth today. You've given us your word. Father, Lord, I pray that for all of us here, may have, we've realized that we've placed expectations on someone in our life. Mayhap we're trying to live up to expectations we've placed on ourselves that are just standards but not Bible. Father, we understand that Paul was trying to tell the church of Corinth that if they were going to live up to their own expectations, they were going to fail and what they should strive for is the person that will one day judge them and hold them accountable, and that's you, Lord. Lord, I pray that if somebody's here this morning, whether it be in person or in the live stream, that they don't know you as their Savior, if they don't know you as their Father, if they don't know you, if, they, if, they, if the time that comes when the day of salvation is at hand, when all that matters is whether or not they believed you as their personal Lord and Savior. They asked you to come into life. If they're unsure if they've ever done that, just that alone, nothing else, that they would take time now to conversate with you. That they say, Dear Lord, I come before you this morning. Father, I pray that you forgive me of my sins. Lord, I trust in you that you died on the cross and rose from the dead. Jesus, I ask for you to come into my life to be my Savior. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if anybody has prayed that prayer, I Nobody's going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not even going to seek you out after the service. I just want to rejoice with you. This will be one of those things that God is going to say, I was proud of you, and he will praise you. If you, if you made that decision today, will you raise your hand and I can rejoice with you? Amen. I see those hands. Friend, maybe you're on the live stream today and you raised that hand. Please message me. I'd love to rejoice with you. Christians today, what about you? Is there expectations in your life that you've placed on yourself? Maybe as a spouse, maybe as a parent, maybe as a child, maybe as a career, maybe as something at your job, maybe something as your Christian walk with God. Or have you placed expectations on others in your life? Say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I, I don't want to follow man's expectations. I want to follow the Bible. I want to live for Jesus. I want to go before him one day and hear the praises of my heavenly Father. 
If that's you today, would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you. My hand's raised. Amen. I see those hands. I see those hands. Let's go ahead and go before our Lord today and pray, pray with Him, give Him thanks. Spend a few moments right now just you and the Lord, you and your Heavenly Father. Maybe there's some decisions that need to be made. Maybe there's some things that you want to be just thankful for. Maybe there's some things in your walk that you want His help in. There's plenty of people in our church that need prayer over. Take a few moments and spend some time with God. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to close out this time of invitation and give you the praise, give you the thanks for the decisions that have been made today. Lord, I'm sure there's people who want to confirm their relationship with you, people who wanted to ask for that relationship today. Lord, there's children here inside the church and on our live stream that maybe have realized they've been living under some men's standards, but not the Bible. Father, help us, Lord, to be biblical in all that we do. To never put man above that which is written, but to live by the word of truth in all of our lives. Lord, help us to grow closer to you in the days and months and years ahead until such an appointed time that we meet you and we hear those precious words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God be with you, my friends, and God bless. We have a business meeting tonight. Uh, Deacons, we are going to be meeting with the uh, treasurer to have a finance meeting at 5. And so, and then we will go ahead and transition into our business meeting tonight as well. For those of us that are watching the live stream, thank you for tuning in tonight, today. It was really a pleasure to be with you. Pray that your day and week will be a blessed one, and I'll see you back on the next appointed time. God bless. God be with you until we meet again.